Welcome to Labor Goes to the Movies. Adrian, you are going to find we, this is a very relaxed, we go in all different kinds of ways. And I promise we, we will talk about your new film, which we're very excited about coming up. But the first thing I, I can say, I was doing some research on your background and I see that you uh, were born in Poland, which is where my folks came from, uh, what, two generations ago. Uh, our name was originally Goralnik. And I realized that I don't actually know how to pronounce your last name properly. I, I'm almost 100% sure it is not pronounced Prawika. Yes, that is correct. It's not. <laughs> so straight, <laughs> straight, straight, straighten yeah. us out here. Straighten us out. Good. Yeah, the last name is pronounced uh, Pravita, which is, I guess, like pizza. The W is pronounced as a V, but I mostly just go as Adrian as well. And that's easier for some folks. So. Either one, but uh, yeah, Pravita would be the correct pronunciation. As a radio person, as a journalist, I, I like to pronounce it correctly. Yeah. Welcome to Adrian Pravica. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Okay. And it's not a minor point yeah. because when I'm looking at the films that you have done, starting with, actually starting with uh, Fourth Partition and then yeah. A Night on Milwaukee Avenue, you yeah. really focused on immigrants in, in Chicago specifically. And of course, Haymarket also involves immigrants. So this is not a detail. This seems important to me somehow. Yeah, I guess it all came from just the curiosity of uh, relocation and uh, American geography on on the migration movements. I think and I live in Chicago, so the history to me hits home, and I'm very interested in just how the city came to be, which it, it has some good things and some bad things. And the Polish migration was uh, one that struck my interest mostly because it was very divided in the city here. Many people that may not know is very segregated, where there is a group of Polish people living on the north side, and there's a group of people living on, on the south side, and that initially got me thinking of the historical context and that was due to labor of course because of the industries which was steel and meat packing in the 19th century and most people lived close to work at that time with no cars and really no way of transportation like we have today everybody lived next to the factory or next to the steel mill or the packing house so naturally they segregated and that wasn't just them i think they were just a small representation of everybody else that's here which you know is irish and African-American and Hispanic and um, Muslim and Indian. So I think a, a lot of these neighborhoods that cre were created in Chicago were basically based on labor and people just trying to find jobs and then trying to find people like them because they couldn't speak English. Now, going to Polish migration, Polish people, of course, uh, didn't have their own country at that time. They were divided and conquered by the Russians, the Germans and the Austrians. So when they came to America, uh, this was the first time they had a sense of identity. They were basically nomadic people with their lands taken. So while in Europe, if you were Polish and you spoke your language, you would have been imprisoned or, or executed. When you came to Chicago, you could actually be Polish. So of course they didn't speak English, but they were conquered by the Germans. So they were naturally gravitating towards the German neighborhoods and German areas because they couldn't speak English or any other language, but they could speak German. So they gravitated towards them. And then of course, when the, the Russian and the, some of the other migrations came later, the Slavic and the Jewish migrations, they would also attach themselves to the languages they were familiar with. So it's interesting how they came to be. And uh, of course that mixed with everybody else who didn't speak the language and you got this melting pot of Eastern and an American a mixture. So uh, that was some of the beginnings of my interest in the concept of labor and how that directed migration. And that's how I lend it to Haymar in some ways. Which kind of leads to this kind of weird kind of question that, that we usually ask folks, which is, you know, what you came over at, at age 10. And I, right. I'm curious about what got, you're, you're quite a filmmaker. We're going we're gonna to talk about this. I want you to talk about Red. I'm <laughs> fascinated by the Red camera. So what got you on this into movies, into being interested in movies and making movies? What, what was, what's your origin story there? Yeah, so I actually, I was born in Wooch, which is, I guess, the Hollywood equivalent of the United States. And I actually grew up next to a, a place called uh, Semaphore, which is known for its uh, animations. Uh, it's an Oscar winning studio in Europe that does animation and stop motion animation. And they basically also have a lot not too far that was a film lot. So I got into films by 
basically watching a lot of sets being brought in and out as a child. And then the big thing in Europe, of course, and this is during communism, there wasn't really much video and film coming from the Western states at that time. I guess I left so early. There's only a few things I remember, but I remember 16 and eight millimeter films. And that's the only way you could get Western movies was by people copying them onto eight millimeter films. I guess instantly got into the whole concept of uh, projection. And when I was maybe a teenager here, I started collecting home movies from around the United States uh, that were 16 mil and eight mil. And then I got into collection, which kind of became an addiction of eight millimeter cameras. So I ended up having all these cameras and all these old films from like the sixties and uh, the New Orleans uh, floods in the sixties and home movies from the thirties. And then it got morbid because I started collecting a lot of movies from the twenties and the teens. So I amassed this collection of all these movies, which I ended up using in some of my films to to try to showcase, which also helped a little bit with the cost because I already had a lot of these films. So I didn't have to license a lot of that footage. So a lot of the footage in all these films is actually my personal collections that I've uh, amassed over the years. That is really cool. All right, Elise, I know I, I got a ton of questions, <laughs> but let me yield to my co-host here who I know is, uh, she's, she's also a fellow Midwesterner, yeah. by the way, out of uh, oh, cool. Detroit. Detroit. Oh yeah, oh, yeah. And, and and the discussion, the whole discussion about neighborhoods, we could we could get into. But I just want to go back to the the, the beginnings again. So that, fascinating. I mean, what did your parents think? As far as the collection of movies, uh -huh. I don't know. I, most of the time, they were working. They were my parents. So my father left the country abruptly in 1986. My grandparents have been in America since the the 60s, and our our family actually has been here since the the 40s, shortly after World War II. Mm -hmm. And so my father left when I was a child. I didn't really know him until I got here. But my mother brought me over, and when my brother when we came here, I would be collecting these things. I, I guess they thought it was just a lot of junk at first, but I think they liked the idea that I was always walking around. I was fascinated by video in generally because of the idea that I could capture moments in time. I don't know. I think they were quite busy working, but once they saw the collection, I think they were just, I don't know, I guess in some ways they were happy I had a place to put it besides in their storage spaces because I ended up getting these big projectors and a lot of these reel cutters and uh, empty reels. And then I met a postman who was retiring and gave me probably about 50 reels of World War II newsreels that they used to distribute during the war. I actually ended up giving a lot of those away, but it's organization in its own way. I don't know if it's the most organized thing, but uh, it's there. So is there a film that you saw in the early years of your life that influenced you, if you can think that, or, or even just you say it's the first film, you remember, future, feature film that you recall watching? Yes. And this is scary. Again, I think being about six years old, you didn't really get too many films from the West. Mm -hmm. And my brother took me to see Poltergeist. Oh my God. Uh, and that was a pretty, uh, yeah, that was a pretty, ow, ooh, ow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So besides watching Walt Disney, like the first experience I had was Poltergeist. And I think Lethal Weapon was like the next one in line that I got to see. But I would definitely say memorable films that they played in Europe, of course, were daytime television dramas, daytime TV come over. So I remember some of that was a big wow. And, and I guess one of the biggest films that I was always influenced by was Dirty Harry. It was one of the biggest popular films. And that really, I think, solidified to me the American rugged individual story, which is Dirty Harry using dirty means to achieve the right thing. I analyzed that later in film class, but when you were a kid, like he was like the coolest guy in the world. I'm just curious about how, and obviously you were very yeah. young and, and, and you came over very yeah. young, but I'm curious about watching Dirty Harry in Poland. Yeah. I mean, how, how does that play in Poland? Or what, what are your thoughts about how that plays in Poland or the Poland of that time? Yeah, at that time, now it's a whole different country. It's much more modern. But at that time, I think everybody thought of America as just wild west because mostly you're in a very secluded society and there's a lot of propaganda uh, at that time, at least. I was actually growing up around the time of solidarity and that was, that was the Reagan, Margaret Thatcher, Voenza era where Reagan was building unions in Poland, uh, strangely. Uh, it's not quite the same stuff that was going on in the United States. But at that time, unionization was huge. Uh, solid the solidarity movement with Le Valenza was amazing. It was actually um, when I spoke later with a gentleman called Bum from Indiana, who was actually uh, a journalist covering that in Europe. He told me that most of the solidarity movement there was based on the civil rights movement of peaceful protest. And that's how they were able to do that. But anyways, it was a lot of ripping down of flags and a lot of physical removal of artifacts of communism at that time because it was transitioning over to a democratic society and, and a political 
system. So I think America at that time through Dirty Harry was this idealistic land of just full coolness. I think we don't, I guess many people don't really maybe realize how important that influence was in the liberation of some of these people, because that ideology carried over, I think, echoed through all those Eastern Bloc countries. It wasn't just Poland. I think Russia and it was falling apart on its own uh, terms at that time. But I think it was this Eden of just freedom and just being able to do what you want in a place where you couldn't do that, where you would have to ask for paper or you couldn't get a typewriter because the typewriter was uh, registered. If you had a typewriter and you were a journalist, you had to have a license for it. It could be taken away. My memories of communism are very negative. <laughs> I, I want to follow this a, a bit because the uh, two things. First of all, obviously, the kind of things that you're talking about that were happening in Poland in terms of tearing down a lot of, of stuff. That, of course, we, we are going through a version of that now. The, the, yes. The, the uh, Civil War Monuments, Confederate Monuments, the, the sort of trying to confront you know, the racism and so forth. But then also, as you say, Poland is a different country now and way better than I do. But I, I do know that there have now been there, there's still an ongoing battle about you know how history is portrayed in poland and and that that is not a settled question right the right wing it's become illegal to say certain things in poland so i'm, I'm curious about your thoughts on that and, and you're coming from both sides from both countries right yeah i would say definitely that one of the biggest things is that it's only been a democracy for, for so many years. I think America has been democratic uh, in some sense, and obviously it wasn't as democratic as it is now. It's progressed over, over the centuries. So Poland's only been a democracy for uh, since 1989. So I think it has a lot of growing pains to come through it. Even though it had the oldest constitution next to the American one, I think their constitution was written in 1795. To get there, it took all the way to 1989. So I think it's just modern. It's a modern democracy trying to go over. There's a lot of people in office still from the previous times, and there's a lot of anger, I think, and a lot of resolution that still needs to happen. And I think, sadly, that's only going to happen when those generations pass away and new generations take over. But I think it's growing just like we're growing here. It looks like we still have lots to go as well. Okay. I, I, I Both Chicago and Detroit are similar yeah. in that there was a large Black migration from the South to those industrial cities in the 20s and 30s, which is when my father's family came to Ecorse, Michigan, not to Detroit proper. But when we did move to Detroit proper, which was 1952, the neighborhood we moved in was largely Polish, Hungarian, and Italian. And one of the things that my oldest sister made me think of recently is she said, we didn't have any racial tension in our community. There were no, no signs burned on the lawn or crosses or anything or, or negative yeah. words said and i said i think it's because it was largely immigrants from europe who hadn't been inculcated in the american racism because this would have been the first generation Polish. yeah i would agree at least i think the fact is that again when you talk about polish migration you're talking about people that didn't have a country and were also executed for speaking their own language so i think oppression in eastern europe especially was a very significant impact on, on many people they didn't almost want to come here, but they were almost forced to come here because of economic oppressions. So they were very much attached to their land in Europe. And in some of my films, I make a point that they always had a plan to go back. They just never did, but they always were here temporarily mentally. I'm always going to go back there at some point, but they never did because it's a great place to live. I think when you travel around the world, you start to really appreciate some of the great things we have. One thing I really realized is great in America. Is, is the legal system of litigation. And I know this kind of sounds very attorney-like, but you don't really have that in many places where if something happens to you financially, there's no protection for you. So people are very insulated. I think the United States in, in one way has a very great litigation process for minor things that really make people's daily lives a little better. And I think maybe a lack of some of these things that we don't see, people probably took very much to. We take for granted, I think, many things sometimes here that, that people across the, the ocean would love to have. Gotcha. So can we rewind uh, and go a little bit further back to the 1880s and Haymarket and that, that group of immigrant workers? Oh, I, the, the opening of the film, well, at least the opening of the trailer, I don't know if the opening of the mm -hmm. film, with the bomb and the, where did that come from? You mean as far as the, I really wanted to start the film with the action instead of trying to build up to it. I really, everybody who watches the film that's familiar with it will immediately think, okay, I know where this is going. 
But someone who may not know the film could think the hay market was just a place to sell hay. I don't know if someone told me something about the stock market, I'd be like, oh, it must be financial stuff. But so I wanted to introduce the fact that this isn't really about selling hay, but that it's it's about a a different event. And I think that's why I kind of brought out the idea of the bomb and the idea of this this explosion right up front to lay it all out on the table and say, well, this is what it's about. And let's take it from there and kind of tell you what happened. It's stunning. That that's what I thought. I immediately thought, "Whoa, where I'm in? Wherever the story is going, I'm in." Because it was so powerful, and the so the people in the background. And anyway, it was a beautiful image. I want to no, I want to follow up on that because to me, a lot of the things, especially in labor history, often with things like this or like Joe Hill, is there are often who done it aspects to it, who threw the bomb and stuff like that. And it seems to me, as in studying that, and I think in the film, there is an important who done it aspect to it. But I, and maybe it's just me living in these times with all the stuff that's going on around immigration, but. That to me is the biggest thing that I feel about Haymarket is just, I mean, you've done the research. When you read some of the stuff that people were saying, it is hideous, right? It's just awful. Yeah, the whole case around it was very divisive. It's, what's interesting is that, of course, at that time, newspapers sensationalized a lot of the, the news because that's how they were paid. So a lot of the facts are very mixed. And I think it's very hard to get the truth out of just a newspaper or even out of the books, I literally had to dig into the actual speeches. I, I spoke with some people that wrote a lot about the film, Jim Green and, and some of the other people that, that wrote on Haymarket. And I noticed that in some cases, they, they also didn't go in, into the a lot of the speeches that were going on. So I ended up reading a lot of the actual speeches by the original uh, Chicago anarchists, which were very powerful and strong speeches. I think some of this stuff is just unbelievable because it lays out things in, in, in very simplistic ways where I think a lot of the newspapers focused on sensationalizing the anarchist movement of just a revolution. I think those people were very much rights activists versus revolutionaries. I don't think they were intentionals were violent, but I definitely felt a lot of desperation in there. So when you're trying to get people's accounts, and then newspapers that were they, were they not right? Were they accurate? Were they just promoting one political idea over the other? There's a lot of in the middle. And I think as far as the whodunit, the film could have gone on for days. The topic is so vast. I think the goal of this film was really to start a conversation versus trying to tell people the entire story from A to Z. And just because a lot of people will not know, I think you're exactly right. People won't know what hay market is. I mean, for people in the labor movement, a lot of people, I think, actually, I think probably think they know more than they actually do. But can you give like a 30 second synopsis of, of what was there? And we'll delve in deeper than that. Yeah. So, so the hay market documentary film is a film that talks about a bomb that exploded during a peaceful protest in 1886 in Chicago. And the protest was part of a national movement of working people fighting for a shorter workday. At that time, people were working 14 to 16 hour days, six days a week. And this was a national organized movement, one of the first in its kind that would advocate for a shorter day, a follow up to a 1968, I believe, 1868 movement that dealt with the government implementing a eight hour workday. And as a result of this explosion, violence occurred that night where both police and workers were uh, killed and injured. And that resulted in the trial of eight workers' rights activists, a trial that most people would say was an unfair trial and a show trial. And then, of course, that resulted in the execution of four of those men, after which seven years later, they were pardoned and acquitted of their crimes. By, and, by, uh, by the governor of the state, by the way. Yeah, yeah. A governor of the state whose career was ruined, as, as well as the careers of everybody who defended the men. And of course, that also was a big blow to the national labor movement, which at that point did no longer actively participate in national organized movements, but more regional and local because uh, the national movement took a, took a big blow from that event. The other thing, and I'd like you to put a little you know, context in there, is that, that the events of Haymarket, the movement, the eight hour movement, the, the rally that day were happening in a global context. This was a global, the, this, was, this was Karl Marx. This was a battle between capital and labor. So this was not just even a, even a, a national movement, there was a real struggle going on over what was happening in the workplace, which again, to me, has a lot to do with what we're going through right now. 
Yeah. You can easily tie this, these same principles to offshore manufacturing and things that are going on today. I think it was the battle of people trying to control their own destiny, which was nothing new in America. I think at that time, when you go through the African-American history, the Native American history, the immigrants were, were the next wave of people that were being exploited. And in some ways, exploitation continues today. But I think these people were trying to control um, their own destiny, working 12 to 14 hours a day, six days a week, removed you from your family. You basically didn't have a father. You didn't have a mother. You didn't. You were raised by strangers and kids were playing in the alleys. There was no safety nets or programs for children or people that were in poverty to help them lift themselves out of poverty. Reading levels were incredibly low and, and people were stuck in a revolving door of poverty and misery and being basically a wage slave to the capital system that was governing that time. In some ways, it was, I think, a desperate move. I think people organized not just because they wanted a union. I think a union was a desperate and a necessary element of people just trying to, to live. If you can't survive working 16 hours a day, you know, six days a week, how can you survive? And my aspect of that is historical, not so much political or organizational, but I think it's, it was just a matter of fact that people were just struggling. So I, I was thinking when we were speaking earlier about in terms of, of the riot and what happened in, in there and the, and the bomb, uh, there's lots of conspiracy theories around the, the Haymarket incident. And so you went through with, with academics and, and sorted through all this. So yeah. one of the, what occurred to me is two things. One was about the police then and the police now. And what happens when you have a peaceful, that as when Black Lives Matter was peaceful, it was like, yeah, whatever. But when things broke out, and oh, it's not, oh, they're violent and it's just terrible and they're ruining our neighborhoods and, and threatening domestic tranquility. And then I remember the story about the mayor. This is my conspiracy tinfoil hat is on. What about the yeah. mayor? Because the mayor of Chicago was supposed to be there, right? He was there. He, he oh, actually, he there. okay. He did come there because he was actually a pretty well-liked mayor. He was a very uh, pro-union mayor at that time. And he came there because he was expecting it to be violent because, well, people died the night before and he expected the workers to be upset about the fact that they were killed at the gates at the McCormick Reaper works the, the day before. <laughs> But as he was witnessing the speeches, he realized that, well, this was an event that wasn't so big. And today, a thousand people on the street is pretty big. I think back then, thousands of people would gather all the time because today we have media that you can learn things. Back then, you literally had to go outside or go talk to somebody. So I think gatherings that were happening were much larger and much closer and much tighter. So I think he was there and I think he went over to the police and he did say that this is a peaceful meeting and it's wrapping up. And what happened after that is is a matter of conspiracy. Did Bonfield purposely take it down because he had a bad experience with rioters? He was uh, a victim of violence from the rioters at some point. Not that he wasn't partaking in uh, a lot of the repression of workers. So he did get injured in the seven, uh, 1877 strikes, and he was one of the most hated police commanders by union and organizational workers. There's a lot of conspiracy whether he thought that generally they were posing a threat or whether that was some sort of a payback or some sort of a personal vendetta that he had against the workers. So there's a lot of conspiracy there, how that happened to happen. I think there's a lot of facts that are missing, and I think a lot of that will remain a mystery because there just isn't enough facts from that time to really establish a 100% pure factual story. I think it's always going to be a little speculative. I'm curious, one of the things, obviously, we love films. And one of the things that we're always curious about talking to filmmakers, especially people who are making films uh, you know, about labor or about just work and working people, is there's a lot of, of ways to, as, as you point out, to do communications these days. So what are your thoughts on the importance and the power of, of film? And, and I do want to talk about because you do other kinds of films. You're, you're, a, you're a camera guy. Yeah. And especially, you should just mention the red camera because not everybody knows about that, but it's this amazing camera. And, and the stuff that you're doing, like with racing, it seems very powerful to me. But can you talk about the importance and the power of film? Yeah, I, I think next to social media, it's probably the most powerful tool, right? I think social media now is such a powerful tool, but film before social media, we all remember films that changed our lives. And at least you mentioned before, is there like a movie that influenced me like Dirty Harry? Well, there's films across the board that really influence people in 
is able to actually change someone's life or affect someone's thinking. I don't know if newspapers can actually do that. I think sometimes we have to immerse ourselves into a fictional story because then there's no boundaries. Just like reading books, I mentioned, I think, uh, I did an interview recently where I talked about The Jungle, where that book was just, to me, it seems like the Bible of uh, the common man in some ways because of the experiences there so many people could relate to. But again, the book is also based in a fictional story based on a on real experiences. And I think if we're sometimes able to take ourselves out of reality and into someone else's shoes or into someone else's life, then I think we're able to change some of our perceptions. And documentary films could do that. But I also think that feature films are very powerful in that matter, where you can almost be yourselves in a certain way with yourself in a movie because there's no boundaries of reality or repercussions because it's fantasy. And I think that's able to change certain things. And I think a lot of uh, films that have that are able to have a great effect on society and on people. So it is a strong medium from that perspective. It's art in a way, and that's what it does. As a person who works on films, it's obviously also a process and it's a physical thing. But just like any artist, I think a film reflects its society, right? You have uh, musicians and painters and sculptors and poets, but they're all really reflecting a certain time frame of society at that moment. And I think in order to do something, you can do films that people should see, but you also have to do p films that people want to see, because in a ways, everybody's creation is a reflection of their time in the society at that place and point in time. I was hoping, I wanted to get some reaction. At least, at least, right. wears, at least wears many hats. And then the one I was particularly yeah. thinking of is she's executive director of the Larry Bear Heritage Foundation, yeah. uh, which has a big focus, obviously, on the arts and the importance of the arts. And frankly, in the labor movement, not, not always as prioritized as they should be. I'm trying to be politically sensitive here, at least. You, you, you can go ahead and say what you want to say. <laughs> About what do we what are we talking about here, Chris? <laughs> Art, arts in the labor movement. Oh, arts in the labor movement. Mm. Okay, yeah. No, I was I was I'm not teeing ting it up for you here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the power of, of images. We think in images, we don't think in words. And so that's why film and video and social media is so powerful and how it impacts what we think and how we feel. And in the labor movement. And we've, cause we've had this question every year since I first came to the first Great Labor Song Exchange, which was 1983 or something like that, of why the labor movement doesn't use this more. Because everybody else needs to know how powerful it is. The people who pay yes. for the Super Bowl commercials know how powerful it is. Uh, and certainly the multi-bazillion dollar industry film industry knows how powerful it is. And why do you think that is? And, and, and Adrian, let's go ahead and, and out you here. You, you, you have done Super Bowl commercials. Um, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I did. I did get a chance to direct a 2018 uh, Super Bowl spot. I think going to the red camera and connecting this to images, interesting you asked that question. So red camera is a revolutionary camera that came out some years ago that was able to drive the cost of film significantly down. Ah. Um, sometimes renting a camera for a feature film would cost, you know, hundreds, $200,000 a month just for the rental of the camera. So we're talking people who would control productions were, were mass individuals with mass corporations and capital backing because it was just too expensive to make a good film. Red revolutionized cinematography by creating cameras that were able to create films at a much lesser cost. You could buy a camera for 70, 80,000, which is still a lot of money. But when you compare it to renting it for 200,000 a month, that's a huge drop in, in overhead costs for productions. And I think that launched a whole new wave of filmmakers. I don't think people like me or anybody who came in the last 10 years would be able to create movies without such uh, innovations, including things like improvement in technology that were able to now create a cinematic medium for a much better cost. And yes, I would definitely agree that imagery and marketing is very important. And now, I am, I am not a, a, I'm not in a labor union, and I took the film mostly because of that. I felt that I could have a more of a historical aspect of the situation than having one from one side or the other. But I will say from a marketing experience, and I've done quite a few years in that, that I feel that is one of the weakest points of organization is the lack of understanding marketing principles. Because even though we want to change things, we are still working within a system. 
And in order to change the system, you have to work that system. You can't just uproot it because it will, uh, at least from my experience, you have to reach the people and those people are reached through a standard system that you have to work and marketing is huge. And yeah, there's billions of dollars spent into trying to push certain agendas on people. And I think if labor doesn't at that same time work those angles, I think it's much harder to reach that audience. It's much harder to reach those people at home because they are used to these new mediums that are being pushed on them, which is social media and all the new things that are coming out. I think that's a really, there's a whole other uh, subject, but I mean, yeah. well, but it's important because, you know, that I think often in the labor movement, I'm sure there's other places too, but where this is what we know, so we'll talk about that, that yeah. our issues are so important and, and so fundamental that we often feel like, obviously, we should have the pro act because obviously workers need protections and so forth. Why do we have to market this stuff? We're just right. So the, the truth shall set us free. And marketing, frankly, and at least it's a dirty word, right? And we would not, it would just really, if you walked into a labor strategy meeting and started talking about marketing. I have, it's not good. It's not good, right? Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, speak from experience. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's not good. But, uh, but as just somebody who's had to go out and, you know, and sell your movie, you can't just tell people, well, this is an important movie and therefore you should watch it. And the least can tell you, and as uh, for Labor Heritage or for the DC Labor Course, I can tell you as director of the DC Labor Film Fest, I can pull up a whole, I did this, my second year, I put together a slate of important capital I movies, capital M, and A, not too many people came. B, they came out. I think they like that by the third or fourth one, people were coming out. What the hell are you doing to us? And I've learned you can slip in some of those ones that folks need to see, but you got to give them, got to give them some stuff that they want to see. Yeah, absolutely. I think one of the things I was just surprised at is that Netflix is a pretty big medium. And what I'm noticing is that I see TV commercials for unions all the time on TV, 30 second, 15 second spots promoting this or that or, or, or politics or they get into political things and a lot of things. But what I'm not seeing is cinematic stories of right. that could change people's lives like right. TV series. There's no funding for that. And when you're trying to say, hey, I'm making a movie and it's going to be about some anarchists, nobody's going to return your phone call. Uh, <laughs> it's very, it's incredible. How do, I, how do I make out the check? I could probably fund a five minute film on, on natural gas with with more money than i could a series on 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 labor honestly that's the reality of the situation and i, I think through stories like tv series now that are coming out people are just immersed in this that having labor stories go through cinematic experiences like netflix and would have an impact i think 10 times larger than a tv spot for 30 seconds that people are trying to skip now this is just my opinion from again a marketing business perspective because preach on, brother preach on. <laughs> Yeah. I don't live, I don't live on funding. I, I have to survive by sale in some ways. So I think there is really where I think uh, these stories are amazing, but they're just not funded. There just isn't much that I've seen, especially with this film to compare to. And I hope that in some ways, maybe that they'll change in some ways. And I think that has to start with that shift in technology and young people and people who are attuned to that technology have to push that forward. I want to, I'm sure Elise has something, but my question is, is why not? Why not? Because, and I will tell you, and Elise knows this, folks come to me, okay, we got to, we'll just talk about the pro act. Everybody's talking about the pro act. I'm like, give me stories, right? I need yeah. stories about people who are affected because I can't just keep telling people about what the legislation does. It just does not it doesn't move the needle. This is a storyteller, right? You, you could put together a film on the pro act, the, what it does, but you think a lot of people are going to stop watching Netflix to watch that? I don't think so. No, not when the last dance is on. That's just, you got that, you got Formula One racing, you have such uh, immersive stories, but what's Formula One? It's a conglomerate of very big companies that are pushing their products on people, but it's just told through a medium that regular people can relate to because it's relating to their lifestyle. And I think in some ways you can relate labor to everybody's lifestyle because we all need a vacation, but talking about that legislation is boring. If you can visual, if you can make them visualize themselves on the beach for two weeks a year, I'm sure people would be like, wait, hold on a second. I want to go there. Why can't I go there? I don't know. I hope I won't get a bunch of hate emails from this podcast, Chris. <laughs> well, well, I'll take the, take the ball for you. At least, uh, um, you know, yeah, I, I was, 
Okay, so I was thinking that in, in, in the story of uh, the Haymarket Massacre, Albert Parsons and Lucy Parsons would be a perfect Netflix movie. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> like, yeah. it, it, how the two of them even got together is a thing that Hollywood movies are not made of. I realized that. You know, it, was like, it doesn't end real well for one of them. I mean, come on. Yeah. It doesn't. But, but it's, I mean, but it's so dramatic. It's got all yes. the elements of it. And he, he was a Confederate spy, and she's this mixed race person living in Texas, and then they moved to Chicago. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's what? it's dramatic and, and death sells. I'm sorry, but that's the reality. Yeah, it does. That, yeah, it does. No tragedy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Dying is with the kids stripped naked and so she couldn't see him at the last. It's just you know. Well, also, and they and yeah. they're and they're freaking heroic figures. Everybody in there, almost everybody in, in that Haymarket story, like you did when you go back and you read it, these folks were heroic, right? Yeah. Yeah, they literally went to their death consciously. There was a way out and they didn't take it. That's in some ways, I feel it's a little bit also, I think Parsons was a very strong character. And I think that played into his ideology as when he wrote some of these books and some of these last encounters, you read from these newspaper guys that spent time with him. I think that's where he was heading. I think that was some of the goals that they had was trying to make a change, even though it was going to cost their lives. And I think, I don't know if there's too many heroes like that today, although, although there is stories of heroism that are pretty, pretty big. I've, I just recently watched a film on Fukushima a Japanese film from their perspective on it mm -hmm. and these people that would just go into this nuclear facility, certain death, and they would save the people that it was the old guys. You think it'd be the young guys like in war. These were mm. old guys mm. who would tell their kids, no, man, you got to go home. I'm your father. I'm going in because by the time he gets me, I'm going to be dead anyways, but you're going to ruin your life. So they would actually take the fall was the retirees would go in and there's heroism in this movie, including uh, Nino Van Zandt and Auger Spies, of course, the woman who married him. Yes. Imagine how these stories could impact everyday, everyday thinking of people working for a living. Those stories could be uh, touching across the globe, but, but yet they're not funded in some ways and you don't really hear them. So I, I said this last time, but my mother, when it, we were watching a war movie, my mother walked through the dining room because she didn't watch television. She said, oh, they're getting ready to start another war. And she said, that's what they do before they start a war. They start showing war movies. And I was thinking, right. what, if, what if labor movies were shown in Alabama? What if people started seeing, not the commercials, not why you should join a union, but the story of people doing the struggle, yes. uh, the victories, the, the defeats, the whole nine yards, but to see that this is not something that's unique to this experience, but there's a history that goes with it because people who are cut off from their history are cut off from their roots and they will, we will die. And that's, yeah, yeah not that. Yeah, well, I mean, go ahead, go ahead. Adrian. Well, no, I mean, no, Adrian, I'm thinking about your earlier films about immigrants, and, and that one of the things, one of the problems we have in this country is that, which has just always boggled my mind, is a country that is made up of immigrants, right? Everybody except those people who are living here is immigrants, and and well, yeah, people, if, people, if you came enslaved, it's not quite immigrant, but okay, but but point is that we don't, as long as we can say that these are other, these are others, that we don't know who they are, then we can, and, and what, whether it's Black people that we can dehumanize or immigrants, I mean, that, that your films, and it seems, and I don't, I'm assuming that it's conscious, but it, it does seem to me like you are actually looking to put, to tell those stories, to, to find those stories of people so that folks, when they you know think about it, they think maybe rethink their ideas about folks that they had to get rid of some of these. You know, I just think about the Trump years. It, as long as you can think oh, that these I are people. No, I don't either. I'm more done with it. But as long as we can think of these as as people that are not us, that I don't want living in my neighborhood or that I'm afraid of. But when you make a film about people and I'm like, oh, those folks actually look pretty cool. They're like, they are interesting and they have lives. And I think that's, to me, part of what you're talking about is can we find the actual stories? Yeah, the American experience is, is great. What we have is you get the people from around the world that come in here and they have all their own ideas and it all blends in, but we all live under a certain regulation. We have some common sense rules that we, we work with, but we seem to be taking these ideas because someone from China might come in and I actually just met a guy a couple of days ago that invented a diabetic watch from China that you will no longer have to poke your skin. It will read your wrist. This is a new invention. 
and he's a Chinese immigrant here. We also have a lot of these other people. Let's look at the athletics. We're able to beat the rest of the world because we have such a diverse crowd of athletes here. We have the fastest runners. We have the fastest high jumpers. We have mathematicians because they all come from somewhere, but we all also live together. So I think my approach was that every one of these people has a story, but we all live together. And I think in Europe, you don't really have that. And I do a lot of work for, for the European market. And it's, it's not like that at all. Like, I think we don't see that here, but when you go to Europe and um, you'll sit on a train, there, there's just, it's just white people, man. There wow. really isn't much diversity. And, and it's a whole different feeling because here you have so much things like even food. There's no Mexican food like in Prague. And if it is, it, it doesn't taste like it. Like there isn't, they're so, they're, they're very ethnocentric in a way by geography and by what they do. It's not, there's nothing wrong with it, but it's just, the diversity here is just so vast. I think, again, what, you have to leave America to see that uh, everybody here brings their own little piece. And, and, and that's, a, at least for me, that was one of the biggest uh, things about living here is just that ideology that if you take all the good parts from everybody, this is the perfect example of how everybody in the world can get along. But you have to just take the good parts because there's also a lot of bad parts too from everybody. People are people <laughs> in some ways. Final thoughts or questions, Elise? No, I was just, I was thinking again about the police and I was thinking about when we were in London, Chris and I were going to a rally and walk along and I, someone reminded me that the reason the, the Bobbies uh, weren't given guns is because they knew it would be the working class killing the working class. Here we are in the United States at this time following the trial of Derek Chauvin and how people were prepared for a riot and how the media couldn't accept that it wasn't going to be a celebration. And you're documenting and you're telling the stories. Um, yeah, I think that's a big question now is how do you police in today's age? How do you do it so that it's accepted by everybody and that no one feels left out? I think that's maybe that's been the question the entire time. I, I don't know. I don't want to get too philosophical here because I don't know if my experience goes so much into law for enforcement where I know a lot of their ins and outs, but it's certainly how do you police a society that, that doesn't want to be policed by the police? Ooh, that's a, that's a deep one. <laughs> right, uh, I, you know. I, I have two things I want to wrap yeah. up with. One is uh, just a technical thing. I was looking at your website and I noticed an interesting thing that you were, you asked people to reach out to you with ideas for for films. And I don't know that I've seen that before. Do you want to describe that process a little bit? It seems like a very interesting process for a filmmaker. Yeah, I, I think, again, it comes to my whole concept that people have to make films that people want to see and not should see. And there's a lot of stories out there that aren't being told. And one of the things I do is I love to have an open conversation about creating movies that have an impact. I think to me has always been to hit a certain audience versus trying to hit everybody because you, you can't hit an entire audience with documentary independent filmmaking. It's impossible. This is, the scales are tipped so far against you. I think the big thing is you can make change regionally and locally, and you can make change and you can make films that really affect people's lives on a more granular level by, by asking them, look, what do you want to see? What, what's interesting to you? And, and what do you think people should learn about? And I think that's one of the big things I like to push is that a lot of these independent films like a like K market, I know it's, it's a major idea, but it's not majorly backed. And that's the truth it needs people to, to come in and, and you, you'd be surprised how many people come out of the woodwork and say, Hey, I'm working on a film here. And there's also a network because people can share ideas that way and can help fund each other's projects and can help bring out some of these stories that are independent and, and unique. And, and you won't find that being pushed to the mass media. So you kind of almost have to have some way to, to try to realize these things. So we're going to have debut on May 1st. We are. <laughs> yeah. And so um, actually that was the last thing I wanted Adrian to talk about because of the DC labor film fest. And actually I think Adrian, we're up to 10 or 11 of our other labor film fests around the country have jumped in and the film's going to be available for viewing. And there's going to be various discussions, but I actually know that you have even more lined up because May 1st obviously is yeah. all built around that. So uh, it's going to be a big week for you. Yeah, about three dozen screenings or so on May Day across the globe. Yeah, it's thanks, guys. Uh, yeah, it's I don't know. I guess I'll have to see how I do. I have a lot of virtual discussions because of COVID. If they get to about 90 people or more, I just I don't know how that's going to go. We'll have to see. That's my honest opinion. And but uh, yeah, it, a lot of organizations have, have come in and helped and, and small and, and bigger ones. And it's been nice to see people just embrace 
the movie uh, for what it is and just being, yeah, let's play it and see what people think. I, I'm hoping there'll be some good discussions and I, I think I won't be surprised. So. All right. Thank you for making the movie. Thank you for, for providing the opportunity. So often in, in labor history, these are things that are forgotten or told from a boss's point of view. So it's really nice to see a film about a hay market. And also for you as a filmmaker, being so willing. I was talking to the Global Labor Film Fest Network folks yesterday, and that's like, well, Adrian hasn't said no yet. Yeah, and I'm, I'm very thankful to, to people like yourselves because I think that's really a lot of the ways that you can get some of this information out. And it's, it's always a two-way street between people who help to tell these stories and then people who help to share them with others. It's nobody can do a movie by themselves and no one can really, if I get a heart attack, I'm not going to operate on myself. Everybody needs each other to, to work together. And I think that's really great of you guys to have some of these alleyways to, to share some of these stories. So I, I hope that only grows. We'll keep we working on it. <laughs> yeah. All right, Adrian and Pravica, thanks so much for making the movie. Thanks for being with us. Look forward to, to seeing more of your work and having you back soon. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks and enjoy the film and we'll see how that goes. Thanks. All right. Thank you. Take care. Yeah, thank you guys. Absolutely. Yeah. Bye-bye.